Thank you, Fraser, for far too kind an introduction. And also thank you for the organizers for putting this together. It's been a really exciting meeting, also a really exhausting meeting. And I'm kind of aware that I'm part of the, uh, the slide down to coffee here. Um, this talk's very much a talk of two halves. So I kind of wrote it originally to be something quite similar to Alberto's, as a kind of overview of the field from the point of view of stereochemistry. I've obviously lost a lot of that. You don't need to hear Alberto's talk again, but slightly worse. I think that would be embarrassing for all of us. Um, but what I have done is I've kind of started my talk by talking about stereochemistry in the context of molecular machines, because we haven't really talked about it as stereochemistry on the way through. Then the second half will be more similar to what Fraser was talking about, this idea of mechanical stereogenic elements. So it's kind of a, a two-half thing. I'll tell you when it's changing. If you want to tune out for the first half, if you know all of this already, I wouldn't blame you. Right, what is stereoisomerism? So stereoisomerism, if you go to the IUPAC Gold Book, basically stereoisomers are molecules where the atoms are connected in exactly the same way, but where they have a different shape. The atoms are arranged in a different way in space. Um, if you asked an undergraduate what stereoisomers were, they would say, well, there's geometric isomerism, which is basically if you have a rigid, non-rotatable bond, you can start arranging groups in different ways around that double bond. Or they would talk about enantiomers, where you have, uh, for instance, four different groups in a tetrahedral carbon. You get two mirror images. Those are non-superimposable. They're distinct molecules. And the reason we teach them to our undergraduates is because they really matter. For instance, just changing the geometry of a double bond can go from something that makes your heart happy, something that makes your heart very sad. So trans fatty acids are bad for you. Or looking at these two very small molecules here, these are mirror images of one another. One of them smells of oranges, the other one smells of lemons. So, you know, these very, very small changes have a really big impact. And to this list, something that maybe undergraduates are starting to get taught, but not necessarily taught universally, I would add mechanical isomers. Because obviously, if you think about the atomic connectivity in these cartoons, it's not changing between these two shuttled states. So they conform to this definition of stereoisomers. And I'm going to come back to other types of mechanical stereoisomers later. So in terms of molecular machines, cis-trans isomerization, which I'm sure um, Ivan will talk a little bit about at least, Geometric isomers are some of the simplest kinds of molecular switches. So we can take an alkene, we can apply a stimulus, it's usually light, we can switch between two states. And that can have some very simple consequences. So um, we can just change the color of our molecule. A lot of people have talked about having stimuli responsive systems. You can have a cis-trans isomerization which switches an ion transporter on and off. That was something that was mentioned, I think, as an early kind of target. But actually, this has already been done. It's being developed by the people. You can switch catalysts on and off. Where's Dean? Um, just by changing the geometry of a, double, of a double bond. And you can switch drugs on and off just by changing the geometry of a double bond. Are these machines? Ivan's shaking his head. Switches are not necessarily machines. If I use a switch, no matter how pretty and ornate, I just use it to turn my machine on, I wouldn't say that switch was part of the machine. It's just the kind of on-off switch. On the other hand, if you put lots of switches together in a clever way, you can start to generate much more complicated systems like my new computer here. And the same is true in molecular machines. So I wouldn't say any of the things I've shown you so far were molecular machines. But this molecule here from Dave Lee just has a geometric switch in the center. But we can start to get what looks like machine-like behavior out of it. So in one state, we can tell it to pick up its cargo. Once it's picked up its cargo, we can tell it to reposition through that double bond isomerization. We reposition our cargo, and then we drop it. I think everyone would recognize that as machine-like behavior, even though we are now talking about a molecular switch at its core. And of course, we can then take that and turn it into a molecular conveyor belt if we have enough postdocs who are willing to make something that size. That's a real challenge in the area. You can make these beautiful prototypes, but turning them into something useful is incredibly hard. 
So the kind of argument I would make is that as you want to go from switches uh, to motors and more complica complicated systems, you've got to control the path of stereoisomerization as well. And we've already seen this. Steve has nicked one of my slides as well. It's the danger of going late in the conference. Um, if you look at this superficially, it looks, looks, just looks like another double bond, another isomerization. But this is perhaps the most famous molecular motor, or an example of one of the most famous molecular motors in the world. This is Ben Feringa's overcrowded alkene type motors. And what makes them special is they combine the geometric isomerization in the center with chiral centers, so stereogenic units either side. And now when we do our double bond isomerization, it doesn't go in each direction with equal probability. You start to get unidirectional, net unidirectional motion. So we can go from this state to this state. We can then have another thermal step. We relax. We can do another double bond isomerization and go all the way back to the start. And overall, our motor will turn in net one direction. So it's all about stereoisomerization. And then you can take these things and you can put them into materials, this subject of our, our conference. And by putting all of these motors within a gel network, just at random, no design, just randomly uh, cross-linking the system, as they turn, they tangle the gel, and the gel shrinks. You actually change a material's property using unidirectional motion at the molecular level, which is very, very cool. But again, it's stereoisomerization. Going back to uh, rataxane switches, Steve's already re-reintroduced them, so I'm not going to do it again. They are switches, but you can then turn them from switches into something that looks a lot more like a molecular machine by controlling the path of isomerization. So this is taking a switch and turning it into a ratchet. We have something which controls when the ring can move, and at the same time, we control if the ring wants to move. So we apply a stimulus. We change where the ring wants to be, but it can't escape. So we're preventing the stereoisomerization. We remove the gate. The ring can now shuttle. We replace the gate, we re remove our stimulus, we put the system back to the initial state, and now the ring can't escape. So we've prevented stereoisomerization. And that's something that's maybe easier to do in interlock molecules than it is in covalent systems. And I think that's one of the, the power of these systems. And so from a switch to a ratchet, we can get net displacement where the task is not undone on re uh, resetting the machine. And then you get from that general concept to these much more elegant systems where we can go to, to pumps, as Fraser has. Or you can take this and you can turn it into a circle and you get through to a rotary molecular machine. OK. No idea how long that took. I'm going to have a little drink of water, and then I'm going to change topic ever so slightly. So. These are molecular switches where we're controlling the position of the macrocycle, controlling the stereoisomerization. That's the main focus, I would say, of the chemistry of interlock molecules. There's been lots of other stuff done, but a, the, the bulk of the work has been on controlling relative molecular motion. There's actually other aspects of mechanical stereochemistry that are much, much less well explored, and they're things that we're very, very interested in my group. So for instance, you can make a polyrataxane where you have multiple different macrocycles along the axle, and you might want to control where each of those rings are. Kind of like DNA, so these sequence-specific polymers that people have been talking about, except for now the sequence is mechanical and not covalent. And that's something that we've, we've published on relatively recently. But the thing I'm going to finish off talking about is mechanical chirality. This is something we're very, very interested in, and this is where uh, you get enantiomers, so uh, mechanical stereoisomers, where there is no covalent chirality in the structure. And the reason we're interested in them is because they create a crowded, flexible environment. And if I was being lazy, I might say that that's kind of reminiscent of an enzyme active site. I'm not going to try and give you guys that line today. But you can get a crowded chiral environment out of these systems. And as an organic chemist, you can start thinking about doing sensing, doing catalysis, using that environment you create with the mechanical bond. So if these are so exciting, and they were first discussed back in 1971 by Gottfried Schill, why are we not using chiral rotaxanes for all our catalysis now? Why is that not taken over if it's this amazing idea? 
And the very simple reason is they're really, really hard to make. So the first time they were isolated in Antiopia was 1997 by Fritz Wertler and uh, Okamoto. And the only asymmetric synthesis was in 4% EE in 2007. So these are molecules that you cannot make stereoselectively, or you could not make stereoselectively until relatively recently. And so back in 2014, we proposed a new approach to this. And this is just to take three components, join them together. What we do in my group is generate new synthetic methodologies a lot of the time. And this uses a very, very high yielding mechanical bond forming reaction that we've kind of optimized over the years. And now rather than making enantiomers, which are very, very hard to separate, you make diastereo isomers, which are not mirror images of one another. And if they're not mirror images of one another, they have different properties. And you can separate them using standard techniques. And if you separate these, you can then remove these auxiliaries, these things that contain covalent stereochemistry, and you can get through to your enantiomers. And so if you can now make them, you can start trying to exploit them. And so we've been thinking about how we can use these molecules. One option is to start thinking about them from the point of view of sensing. So you can create this environment where you've got well-expressed mechanical stereochemistry, you can bind small molecules in, and then if it's R, your molecule can tell you it's R. I mean, that's the basic idea of a sensor. Um, that was first done back in 2006, but it's kind of an isolated example, and we're starting to get some progress on that, but I'm not going to tell you about that today. The other option, which is going to the enzyme type idea, is you can start doing catalysis. So you can use the crowded environment here to influence the outcome of a catalytic reaction and get one stereoisomer at the other end. And that's something we've had recent success on. And we've chosen a specific reaction here. I've realized I'm going to run slightly short today, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about this slide than I was intending. So gold catalysis has one big problem. And the really big problem with it is you have your ligand, you have your gold, and then you have your substrate. Gold has a linear coordination geometry. So if you want to influence what's happening around your substrate, you've got to get some information from your ligand. You've got to influence the space over here. And the way people solve that a lot of the time is they build really big catalysts. There are other solutions, but that's the typical solution. The nice thing about an interlock molecule is your macrocycle automatically kind of reaches into that substrate space very, very effectively. And so that's why we targeted gold catalysis. And we take this reaction, we take our chiral interlock molecule, which we made using our diastereoselective synthetic approach, and we get a reasonable enantioselectivity. With our R, we've got selectively the RS product. And if we take the S enantiomer of our rituxane, we get the opposite outcome. And actually, I haven't put it on this slide, but if you compare that to the best covalent catalyst for this reaction, these numbers are pretty comparable. And the reason I find this exciting is because we didn't design this molecule to be very good. You know, people have been making covalent catalysts for a long time, and they've optimized them. We made the only thing we could make quickly, and that took two years. So that tells you where we are synthetically at the moment. But the first one we made, we managed to get good enantioselectivity out of. So we're now in a position, because our synthetic methodology has kind of caught up with us while we've been doing this project, where we could start making different versions of this catalyst and optimizing this, and then taking it onto different reactions. It turns out to be pretty general as well. So this isn't a one-hit wonder. These are comparable results to lots of other systems in the literature. So it's actually a decent catalyst, despite its lack of design. I'm going to finish off by uh, uh, Alberto delegated to me his recent paper. It's always dangerous to delegate to one of your competitors, <laughs> but I'll be kind. <laughs> so that's killing me with kindness, isn't it? You published first. Um, so, so far, I've been talking about fixed mechanical stereogenic elements. So, the requirement for this system is that we have two different ends to our axle, and our macrocycle has some kind of sequence information that's represented by these three colors. If I look at this molecule down here, 
It's not chiral. That might not be as easy for some people to see as others, depends if you're into cartoons and molecules, but if you put a mirror plane flat with the macrocycle, you get the same molecule back. So it's an achiral system. But if the macrocycle shuttles just a bit one side of the middle of the axle, it desymmetrizes the axles. The position of the macrocycle is now controlling the stereochemistry. So it shuttles one way, you have one enantiomer, and if it shuttles the other way, you have the other enantiomer. So now we have a stereodynamic mechanical stereogenic element. And of course, as everyone hopefully knows, if I put this thing in solution, I'm going to have a 50-50 mixture. The golden rule is no chiral information in, no chiral information out. But how about if I feed it a guest that has stereochemical information? Now when I form my host guest complexes, I form diastereoisomers. If those have different energies, and I have different amounts of my stereoisomers, I can bias this equilibrium. And unfortunately, that's exactly what Alberto did. He made this molecule here. And the important thing is we have our sequence information, our macrocycle, which is actually just this R group up here. I haven't drawn it in. It's just a pyrene fluorophore. And if the macrocycle is on one side of the center, it's one stereoisomer, and the other side, it's the other. He also did a very clever trick. If you protonate this molecule, the macrocycle sits perfectly in the middle, and it's achiral. So you can switch on and off the mechanical stereogenic element, which I think is a really nice trick. So he made this molecule. He looked at it in solution. He has a 50-50 mixture. And then he fed it a guest. He fed it this anion. And this anion binds to this triazoleum here. So this one's exposed. This one's hidden by the macrocycle. And so this guest here, binding to the exposed triazoleum, leads to different energies of our two co-conformations and a biased population. And so now we are using guest binding to influence the position of our macrocycle and then generating a chiral system selectively. I think it was 85-15, roughly, which is, we've got like six to four, so. Uh... At minus 60 degrees. <laughs> so it's a, it's a very, very cool result. Um, I haven't shown our system here because it's not ready for prime time. The one thing that I would love to have seen in your paper, Alberto, because one of the things we'd really like to do with this is use the guest binding to amplify a circular dichroism signal. And that's the one thing we do have. When our guest binds, we bias our population a tiny amount, but we take a CD silent guest and we get a CD response from the host guest complex. So we're using our stereodynamic system to give us a, a CD response. It's not a very strong CD response, I should add. Okay. So I'm coming to the end, um, and I'm, I'm going to finish with a really difficult slide, so everyone kind of hold your breath. This one gives me a headache, so we'll see how you guys do. Um, but first I'm going to say, dynamic chirality in interlock molecules is actually not a singular uh, system. Because all of these things are stereodynamic interlock structures. Some of these have been made, some of these haven't. You might not think this is stereodynamic, but Steve Loeb has recently demonstrated that you can make rings shuttle past one another. So if you shuttle the red ring through the other ring, you will get the other stereoisomer. This system here is a system that Fraser was studying back in the 1990s or early 2000s, I think, so the mechanical helical chirality. But some of these have never been studied or even discussed. So we wrote a review, which I haven't got a reference for here, but when we started writing the review, we thought it would be very quick, and then it turned out there are lots of mechanical stereogenic elements out there. And so it went to 45 pages and took like six months to write. I'm going to finish by showing you this molecule here and the kind of dynamic stereochemistry it displays, just to show you the richness you get out of these systems. So this one hadn't been described before, and this gave us a real headache. So this molecule here, this is a chiral co-conformation. If I take this ring here and just rotate it by 90 degrees, I get a new stereoisomer. So far, so exciting. I can do a lot of 90 degree rotations in this system. 
And this shows you the network of stereoisomers, with each of these arrows representing a 90-degree rotation of one of the rings. What's really weird about this system, and I think this is one of the things that makes me think this could be a really rich vein for investigation, is everything on the top is the enantiomer of what's on the bottom. So that's that one's enantiomer. So if you look at the system, to go from this chiral structure here, 90 degree rotation gets you to a different diastereoisomer than another 90 degree rotation gets you to the enantiomer of your starting material. So you go through an all chiral pathway. So you never go through the racemate as you go from here to here. There is only one achiral co-conformation in this system, and that's this guy here, which is an S4 symmetric system. So mechanical stereochemistry opens up quite a large playground for looking at dynamic processes, as well as these static stereogenic elements that I showed you before. OK. So after all that, thank you. Happy to take questions. I'll take just what? <laughs> yeah. uh, in the very last slide you showed, you were doing, uh, in the very last slide you were doing 90 degree rotations. Yeah. Um, what, why not like a 30 degree or, or other types of rotations? Would those also be unique? They would also be chiral. I think what we were trying to do with the 90 degree rotations is they're kind of limiting co-conformations. So they're always going to be lower symmetry if they're less than 90 degrees, just because of the symmetry of the ring itself. So everything along that path would also be a different stereoisomer. So the idea is to design the Yeah, I mean, if you were thinking about making these, you'd make stations at the, at the interfaces between these regions, and those would be the limiting co-conformations. It's one way you could think about investigating them. So I guess you would agree, Steve, that um, with the advent of mechanical bond, there is a huge revolution occurring now in stereochemistry. I think there's the potential for it. Well, that's the problem. It's kind of semi-infinite. If you, if you say, I'm going to complete the set, yeah. you're basically wishing your life away. Because I've shown you stuff with two components. As you raise the number of components, you essentially generate new stereogenic units, and you can just keep going from there. But if you, even if you just limit yourself to two components, there's a good kind of 20 or 30 things to look at. So for the chemists and for the non-chemists, I just want to flag up the fact that chemistry is an enormously creative medium. And anybody who says that chemistry is an old science, after you listen to somebody like Steve, get lost. <laughs> it is so young and it is so able to reinvent itself that um, it's on a road to more and more creativity. It's like uh, somebody painting, um, causing a revolution, I guess, the way somebody like Picasso did. Or somebody who introduces new sculpture into uh, our lives, like Epstein. Or uh, introduces uh, a new way of writing, whatever, chemistry creates its own object, and as such, you have this enormous opportunity to uh, be creative. And I would argue that this ballpark that you're playing in is going to outlive you in terms of uh, the opportunities, right? Absolutely. Chemistry is the youngest of all the scientific activities because it invents itself over and over and over again. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Professor.